um, we'll start uh, today's webinar that is on uh, cyber technology and criminal investigation. We have uh, Dr. Nagratna Madam here. Uh, now I'll start uh, introduction of uh, Nagratna Madam. Respected uh, Dr. J. Malika Junaya, sir, dear friend and resource person. Good morning, all. Respected uh, Principal Dr. J. Malika Junaya, sir, dear friend and resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Nagratna, madam, dear colleagues, participants and my dear students. I take the privilege of introducing resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Nagratna, Associate Professor of Law and Coordinator, Advanced Center for Research, Development, Training in Cyber Law and Forensic. In 1999, Dr. Nagratna has graduated in law with first rank and five gold medals. She has qualified UGC NET and awarded with UGC Junior Research Fellowship. I am happy to share that Dr. Nagratna has started her academic career at our college <laughs> and then joined National Law School, India University, Bangalore in 2006. She has been teaching legal research and methodology and IPR laws to LLM Distance Education course, Kuwempu University since 2002. Her areas of specialization include criminal law, cyber laws, and commercial law. Her areas of interest include jurisprudence, intellectual property rights, medical law and ethics, legal, educational and professional ethics, and women in law. She has published several articles and contributed several chapters to various international and national journals and books. Her research work titled Patients' Rights Under Consumer Law was published by Karnataka Institute of Law and Parliamentary Affairs in 2009. She has presented various research papers at the international and national seminars, conferences, and workshops, and has attended national seminars as resource person. She is a member of review committee, syllabus, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Karnataka, and also a member, panel of experts, LLM program, Karnataka State Open University, Mysore. She is a life member to the South Asian Society of Criminology and Victimology and also a member of International Institute of Information Technology Laws, Bangalore. With these words, I welcome Dr. Nagratna to this August gathering. Welcome Dr. Nagratna. I also welcome our principal, beloved Dr. J. Malika Junaya to today's function. I also welcome my dear colleagues and participants and students to today's function. Thank you. Thank you one and all. I request uh, Nagratna Madam to uh, carry on with today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. A very good morning to all. Uh, dear J. Malikarjunaya sir, Anita. <laughs> uh, my dear friends and uh, all others who are attending today's webinar, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to always be amidst this wonderful gathering. <laughs> I always feel back home. And one sentence I always repeat. 
so uh, today's talk is on an extremely important extremely vital issue that is about using cyber technology in the process of investigation i um, understand uh, that uh, we have mixed gathering of uh, attendees including students who probably might not have done criminal procedure code so i'll try to keep it as basic as possible i'll just try to uh, share the slide yeah. Yeah. Are these slides visible? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so when it comes to criminal investigation, like most of the other parts of criminal process, be it inquiry or trial, criminal investigation is largely the responsibility of the state. This is because of our basic understanding of the concept of crime. So unlike civil offenses, crimes are usually considered as more serious, so serious that these are regarded as offenses against the state. So therefore, when a crime is committed, we expect the state to regulate this crime, including by way of investigating such crimes and also by way of conducting trial. Also, the punishment is supposed to be imposed by the state authority. So again, unlike uh, civil offense, so the entire burden rests upon the uh, state. Uh, so based upon the state, which is in fact the general uh, uh, approach that we've adopted, though there are a few exceptions. So even within crimes, some offenses which are not so serious in nature by declaring them as non-cognizable in nature or compoundable in nature, we allow the parties to deal with those crimes, but generally serious offenses which are legally considered as cognizable in nature, we uh, expect the state to investigate. So, and when I say state, it's the government. And within that, if you look at the list of uh, the constitution, which uh, uh, segregates the subject matters that needs to be dealt with by the state government and the central government, law and order and criminal investigation is the domain of the state government. So both ways, it is a state as well as within the state, it's a state government, which will have to conduct the investigation. Though again, for this also, there are exceptions that certain offenses can be investigated by the other investigating agencies like say NCB or CBI, but otherwise generally a crime is supposed to be investigated by state police. And the obligation is completely on the state um, uh, to collect the evidence and to prove the guilt of the accused. And all these are subject to certain principles that are uh, uh, enunciated through constitutional law provisions as well as the CRPC and other criminal you know, special enactments. So coming back to investigation, so investigation is completely the obligation, the domain, the duty of the state agencies. Uh, and however, as I just mentioned, it is subject to certain principles and some principles are extremely important and it cannot be compromised. And for example, Article 21, which is all about right to life, further states that right to life, which also includes right to liberty. And now because of Supreme Court's you know, a recent uh, judgment reiterating uh, that right to privacy is also part of right to life. So these are not completely absolute, right? Because this can be restricted to reasonable, uh, subjected to reasonable restrictions, provided you have a law that allows such restrictions. And such law you know, provides for a procedure which is just fair and reasonable. So which means that this procedure through which you encroach on the right of the uh, person, especially right uh, to life, liberty, and privacy, uh, needs to be provided through a law framework. For example, it can be provided through criminal procedure code. However, the rules provided in the CRPC or any other procedural law is supposed to fulfill the test of fairness, reasonableness, etc. So which means the same principle should also apply when we utilize ICT technology or cyber technology in the course of investigation. So let's see you know, if that's possible completely or what are the challenges that affect this. Similarly, another important principle that guides the entire criminal process, including supposed to include, uh, supposed to also guide the investigation processes, the principle of presumption of innocence of the accused. So and as long as you do not prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt, he's supposed to be considered or presumed to be innocent. So, and then once the uh, 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 evidence is collected, you produce it before the court. So you have the duty, that is the state has the duty or otherwise complainant has the duty to prove the guilt of the accused and that too, it should be beyond reasonable doubt. So these are the general principles of criminal liability, but there are exceptions to this. For example, strict liability offenses. So the burden of proof is usually not beyond reasonable doubt. Certain basic elements needs to be proved. 
So beyond that, the court can presume the guilt of the accused. So subject to those exceptions. So otherwise, generally these are the guiding principles. In addition to this, there are other principles which are also recognized through various other provisions of CRPC as well as constitution. Most importantly, the right of the accused to remain silent. Now, especially when you apply this in the context of, say, digital devices which belongs to the accused, which might have incriminating evidence. So this raises the question as to whether the accused is under an obligation to you know, produce the same when the I.O. asks for. And can the I.O. You know, look through entire content of the digital device which belongs to the accused? So all these questions are to be, again, guided through principles like this, including, most importantly, right against self-incarnation or generally referred to as right to remain silent. Similarly, there are many other principles which may not be as of now relevant to uh, the topic that we are discussing, like you cannot give a retrospective effect to a criminal law or like arrested persons or a person under detention also has you know, a couple of rights that are guaranteed to constitution. And most of these provisions from the constitution also have parallel provisions in CRPC. Uh, coming to the most important uh, right, which I just mentioned, Article 21, which guarantees right to life, liberty, as well as privacy. So as long as you use the ICT technology in the course of investigation in such a manner that this right doesn't get affected, it's fine. But today, that's where the challenge lies in, because the usual you know, uh, procedure of investigation these days, of recently, uh, has been you know, uh, where uh, the IOs you know, get access to electronic gadgets, most importantly, mobile phones, laptops, Know, used by the accused or the parties you know, somewhere affected with the crime or it can also include most importantly collection of um, information in form of CDR, score data records etc. So the very first question is can IOS get you know, uh, access to this without any legal you know, scrutiny firstly. Secondly can they use this as evidence? So in the light of Puttaswamy judgment there are reservations expressed by jury saying that you can't you know, anymore use this or anymore even collect this without the approval of the court. So thereby raising the question as to do, do you in, uh, mean to say that in every such case you need the warrant of the court to confiscate electronic gadgets. So as of now law is not settled. There are a couple of high court decisions which says it's mandatory but um, uh, from Supreme Court we are you know yet to see how the law develops on this regard. So there is coming to the basic term investigation. So what does investigation mean? For a layman investigation can also include what private detectives do or what industries do, especially MNCs today have their own cyber forensic investigation units and all. But when you look at the legal definition given under CRPC, section 2H defines investigation quite comprehensively by saying that this includes all the proceedings under CRPC through which you collect evidence. However, it is supposed to be conducted only by a police officer or any other person who is authorized by a magistrate. So it's very, very narrowed down when it comes to as to who is empowered to investigate. But the procedure of investigation is very, very wider. So whatever I do in order to collect evidence can be termed as the procedure of investigation, provided I am an investigating officer, that is a police officer, or I'm authorized by the magistrate to conduct the investigation. So collection of evidence, again, is a wider term. So as I said, whatever I do in order to collect evidence uh, is said to be investigation. So therefore, this can even include proceeding to the crime scene and especially in the context of crimes which involves evidences in form of digital you know, gadgets or you know, electronic uh, gadgets, etc. So sometimes proceeding to the spot may not be necessary, but sometimes it might be necessary. For example, where an accused probably sitting you know, in a cyber cave and is using computers to send terror emails, etc. So maybe to catch him red-handedly, police may have to go immediately to the crime scene. But otherwise, unlike the conventional crime, like murder, etc., proceeding to the crime scene need not always be a part of investigation, especially when you're looking for evidences from cyber space or in form of cyber technology. But otherwise, as was indicated by Supreme Court in Rishbud's case, Again, investigation is a very, very comprehensive procedure, which starts with uh, usually registration of FIR and immediately after that proceeding to the crime scene and then you know, doing any, anything or everything through which, of course, legally with all uh, you know, legal parameters. Um, so uh, anything or everything that I do in order to ascertain the facts and circumstances of the case. And sometimes it can also include discovering and arresting the accused person. So again, over here, all these are subject to the discretionary power of the IO. So no one can like, you know, monitor or guide an IO. Like it's only the police department which is supposed to do. Even court cannot interfere when the matter is under investigation. So it's the discretionary power of the IO. And 
Using this, he can also collect evidences in form of statements of the witnesses, as well as he can even conduct search and seizure and seize material evidence, documentary evidence, any evidence which might be essential for the case. So therefore, what I do in the course of investigation varies from case to case, varies from evidence to evidence. And similarly, when it comes to say using uh, the cyber technology in the course of investigation, how I use, what I use, to what extent I use should vary from case to case, should be you know, basically done with the object of collecting evidence. Based on all the evidence collected, the IO prepares a report and submits the same to the magistrate, which is generally referred to as charge sheet. Thus, as I just mentioned, the entire procedure is very, very comprehensive. So it starts with, usually it starts with, again, whatever I'm saying are all general practices and rules, so there can be exceptions. So it starts with registration of FAI, which is you know, indicated through section 154 of CRPC and end, ends with filing of charge sheet under section 173. Now coming to the uh, whole issue that we're supposed to discuss today, how do you and like you know when do you and uh, 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 to what extent do you use cyber technology in the course of criminal investigation? And again, I am limiting my talk only to criminal investigation as provided under CRPC, not getting into you know private investigative agencies techniques or like cyber forensic teams techniques of investigations within industry. Uh, so use of cyber technology in criminal investigation, why is it even required? It's extremely important today to use this as a tool for the reason that you know, this technology has been extremely advantageous. So advantageous that uh, on one hand, it can be used as a tool or a target of criminal activity. At the same time, it can also be equally used as a tool in the hands of investigating agency, tool to collect evidence, tool to collect data, sometimes tool to collect uh, you know, the information which can at least help in cracking down the uh, case. So sometimes it can be evidential in nature, the information I get through this technology. Sometimes it may not in itself be uh, uh, evidence, but it can lead to further collection of evidence. Since almost everyone is using this technology, so many times you might come across criminal uh, 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 incidences in which maybe parties associated with criminal act would have used the technology, which is in fact you know, a reality today in most of the cases. So why and uh, that is how you can at least crack the case and sometimes even collect the evidence. For example, the GPS location of the accused along with the victim, if at all is same, so it will at least give an indication to the IO that you know probably you know, they were together at the time of committing the offense. And then if you can integrate it with our evidence law principle, with the last seen you know person with the uh, victim, you know, so those lines we can link and then show some extent of circumstantial evidence. Uh, since it is an extensive usage in general, as well as for criminal activity, so it definitely becomes one of the tools that the IO should look for, one of these you know, source of information that the IO should look for. And it's not just limited to cybercrime cases, even conventional crimes today involves a lot of evidences which are digital in nature. So therefore, an IO inevitably will have to you know, come across these kind of evidences. As I was mentioning earlier, so this is a source of huge information, like the mobile phone which was in the possession of the victim of crime, or which was in the possession of suspect involved in the crime, or at least witnesses, eyewitnesses. You know, so their mobile phone, their GPS location, CDRs, call data records might all be helpful in you know tracking the case. Uh, so therefore, sometimes this can lead to collection of evidence, and not every information can be evidence. So therefore, I'm segregating the two. Sometimes I can only get information. Sometimes those information in itself can be evidence. Sometimes it can lead to further collection of evidence. And today, it is essential to integrate the usage of this technology uh, to uh, the criminal process, including investigation. And most often, this becomes the platform for collection of evidence. Now, earlier days, if you had to collect evidence or even information from another police officer of another jurisdiction, etc., you had to do a lot of paper-based you know, formalities. Even today, that's required. But then, you know, all those can be you know, parallelly done. But um, um, uh, on the other hand, you can start collecting evidence, start exchanging intelligence information through online platforms. Now, when it comes to crime, like how an accused can use this technology to commit a crime, again, he gets various ways through which he can use this technology to commit the crime. For example, even preparation to commit crime you know, can be more easily done with the usage of technology because earlier days, if I had to commit a crime and to prepare to commit that crime, you know, I had to uh, you know, uh, uh, collect a lot of information and all, so which would be difficult, but now it's so easier. 
because most of the cases that are investigated itself have indicated through media reports also have shown how many times uh, the accused before committing crime would have search for information relating to how to commit the crime and all. So even preparation to commit crime is easier. Similarly, uh, people having uh, intention to commit crime can easily come on one platform, conspire with each other. So that's how like today, online platform is becoming a platform for a lot of terrorist activities, a lot of activities that comes under, falls under the definition of organized crimes. Or otherwise, even simple crimes, you know, people can come together, share their you know, designs or plans of committing crime and use this technology to you know, conspire. And this is what we even saw in Mumbai terror attack is it was only a few people who entered Mumbai, but then they were consistently in touch with other, you know, uh, uh, accused from another uh, other country. So there was continuous, you know, planning that was going on, you know, at every stage of uh, that uh, terror activity. So because the technology has replaced people, and it has replaced the platform where people could exchange their thoughts, and this has become, in fact, the platform for information relating to bad or good things, etc. So when this is the extent of dependence. You know, by the uh, criminals for committing criminal activity, parallel for the same reason, is it becomes a potential tool in the hands of investigating agencies because for what has happened through this technology can better be collected, you know, uh, by the investigating officer by using this technology. Now, how do you use this technology in investigation? So one approach I would take is go section by section and say how this can be integrated with cyber technology, the sections provided in the CRPC. And in addition, beyond this, also there are many ways through which we can use this technology to collect evidence. So coming to the first provision, which is about registration of FIR, it's a fact that in a country like India, you know, not in every place you will have nearest police station where the uh, victim of a crime or the informant can go to the crime, uh, can go to the police station register FIR. So even now there are dense forests. I know, I know, from, I know from where people would want to come out and file uh, FIR or you have like, you know, Nagzil affected areas, so a lot of other places where maybe immediately, you know, uh, in the nearest vic uh, you know, vicinity, you don't have police stations, one reason. Secondly, for uh, some uh, uh, kinds or uh, some kind of offenses, victim may not be willing to come to the police station to register FIR. So therefore, this whole thought of having a parallel you know, platform where FIR could be registered came. And in fact, as a response to this is the reason why in a lot of cases, court started saying that you, know, you can also file online FIRs. It started with allowing for registration of FIR through uh, telephone. And now they also allow registration of FIR through online platform. And last year, in fact, Ministry of Home Affairs has come up with an online portal where people can go and file cybercrime related complaints. And this also allows for filing of anonymous complaints. So this is how you can see that you know, the very initiation of criminal investigation, which starts with registration of FIR, can also happen with the use of cyber technology. But this is not advisable in every case because Section 154 itself says that an IO should be sure that the information he is acting upon to even register FIR and to initiate investigation is a reliable one and makes out a cognizable offense. Now, when you allow people to file anonymous and online complaints, there might be tendency to file you know, uh, information in relation to non-cognizable cases, or it can lead to like you know, opening the door for vexatious, frivolous complaints and all. But that uh, concern is aside. But at least for serious offenses, that immediate initiation of investigation procedure is important, which can only happen provided you have easier means through which FIR can be lodged. And I think like cybercrime registration portal is one such you know, good example. So once the FIR is registered or if there is an order by the magistrate to investigate, the investigation begins. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's completely the discretionary power of the IO as to what evidence he collects, etc. So when it comes to using this technology, he can use cyber technology as I said earlier, to collect information in form of intelligence or in form of, say, CDRs, in form of, you know, called, uh, like called data records or CDR or in form of, like, you know, internet, you uh, know, interception, etc. So there are various procedures through which you can collect, the IO can collect a lot of information. But again, keeping in mind the principle laid down under Article 21, you can't simply encroach on my privacy just because technology allows you to do it. So today, it is easier to conduct electronic surveillance to do internet interception. But then since it raises the question of privacy, we have legal restrictions. Section 69, 69A and 69B of the Information Technology Act, though allows the government to um, 
get into electronic surveillance internet you know interception and also allows the state to block you know internet communication but all these are subject to reasonable restrictions as indicated under article 21 so section 69 69 and 69b also lays down lot of procedural safeguards so once you comply with those procedural safeguards etc yes of course you can do internet surveillance you can do internet interception and through that also you can collect evidences even in form of say uh, the email content or cdrs etc so thus you uh, know by adhering to 69 69 69b you can collect evidence in the course of investigation but one problem if you see from investigating agency perspective is that this procedure provided in the 69 69 69b are too rigorous and uh, you know many times you know you may not get that permission and also not every police officer is authorized to even conduct e surveillance for example because section 69 do empowers the state agency again minister of home affairs has come with list of agencies which can conduct electronic surveillance and as of now it only includes 10 agencies and that is you know inclusive of nia national intelligence agency cbi delhi Com police commissionery so like this they have just specified 10 agencies so not you know a regular police officer is authorized to do this uh then coming to the next stage of investigation when you would want to record statements of witnesses as an io i can call any witness to police station you know any person who is acquainted with the facts of the case to police station however if it is a woman or a child below 16 years or an age person above 60 years instead of calling them to the police station i have to go to their house you know rec record their statements now this is where in large number of cases especially today especially in the context of cyber crimes we see that investigating officers are struggling to even get the attendance of the witnesses because most often the witnesses are not in your jurisdiction especially in cyber crime matter maybe the victim is from bangalore so has registered an fir in bangalore but one of the witness may be in say mumbai or delhi so i can't expect him to come to bangalore so even if he comes i can't expect him to repeatedly come at the same time i cannot afford to pay for his travel every time as an io though we though the ios do have budget to uh, use for this but it is not enough to you know facilitate frequent travel and all so this is where there is a limitation in the law so as of now the law requires that recording to happen you know physically actually but then if this can be substituted with online recording of witness statement so i'm talking about 160 161 not during trial so if online recording of witness statement you know can be facilitated through using cyber technology it can solve large number of you know, uh, cases however the evidentiary value of this statement is very very less but then many times this is helpful for the io in cracking the case or in you know, further collection of evidence so therefore this is where there is a need to change the law however when it comes to certain serious offenses say like um, a sexual assault on a child um, or sexual assault on a woman especially when it comes to child so we have provisions in pokso and similarly recently added provisions to crpc so where the witness statement can be recorded by using video recording facility and once you record it there is no need of further recording later during trial especially if you are complying with safeguards provided under 164 now 164 is about magistrate recording the statement of witnesses victims accused so if this is all done through video conference etc so the law says this can be used in lieu of you know examination in chief in lieu of in the sense in the instead of examination in chief you can straight away use this you know recorded statement during trial why because you are not just recording it on document but also you know making a video recording so that you know you can always go back to this you know video recorded statement if at all it is essential to be reassessed or reviewed so that is an example of how you can use cyber technology to better facilitate the investigation and that has already uh, you know happened uh, in with relation to say sexual offenses uh maybe similar you know change in the law is essential when it comes to serious most offenses at least those which are punishable with more than 7 years some parameter like that can be set so that the procedure of investigation is further facilitated by integrating ict technology within the entire process of collection of evidence uh then comes the most important and a crucial stage so that is about search and seizure uh which uh, usually happens at the section 165 but parallel to this we have other provisions like 91 etc where an io or even a court can issue summons to a person asking him to produce the document or the material which is in his possession or when i have reason to believe that summons might not be helpful i can issue search warrants or when it is a case of emergency 
the io did not have to even wait for search warrant he can himself go to the place where he has reason to believe that he can collect evidence you know he can come across evidence crucial for his case so in those cases without a search warrant under section 165 he can go and conduct search and seizure now again this is where you need to do that physical search to collect the evidence and all so that's where probably ict technology cannot you know give you a parallel platform but of course using again video recording at the time of confiscation of evidence and all might help in proving the reliability of the evidence so at least when possible the io should resort to making video recordings of the seizure procedure but again this is not always possible in every case so this might be subjective decision that the io should take when it comes to collection of evidence from abroad we have a very very complicated process laid down under section 166a usually referred to as mlat process mlat process so according to this process so, so provided india has signed an agreement with the other country from where you are forcing for collection of evidence and this agreement is called as mutual legal assistance treaty so if you sign this treaty with the country so you can send the letter of request which goes through a very again you know very complicated process you have a channel that's been established uh, so the channel is like the io writes it to the local court the local court forwards that letter you know which is usually called as letter rogatory or it's also called as letter of request so the letter is sent by the uh, uh, io to the magistrate from the magistrate to ministry of home affairs and then a copy goes to ministry of external affairs then it goes to the concerned countries diplomatic agency and through them it goes to that country and uh, in the same you know, process through the same channel if at all the evidence is available it comes back to our country according to justice krishna who has drafted pdp you know bills first version so he himself says that the time the minimum time taken to collect evidence through this channel is not less than 8 months so it's a time you know consuming process and many times the kind of evidence especially of recently these days the kind of evidence we are collecting through this channel is nothing but data from the server located in another country or in say form of some other digital evidence some data in a server etc you know from clouds etc again remote servers of another country so which means that even for digital evidence we are adopting a you know a, a, a procedure which was laid down in crpc long back even when we weren't aware of ict technology so probably there is a mismatch between how you know things have developed today and what the law is expecting so that's why probably you need a change so one better option is to allow for mlat process to take place through online platform so why this letter rogatory process you send the letter through all this channel and all so why can't we just do this through emails and circulate the you know information and evidence you know as early as possible Uh, we can see for remedies which are already available in form of budapest convention budapest convention otherwise known as european convention allows member states to exchange information 24 bar 7 you know uh, in relation to serious cyber crimes including child pornography etc and they also allow for exchange of evidence so i'm repeatedly using two terms exchange of information exchange of evidence sometimes they can be the same but so, you know, legally it's not always one and the same so they allow for exchange of evidence between the member states in the most easiest manner possible but since india is not a party to budapest convention so you know we can't expect that benefits uh, to uh, our request uh, so that's where again we need a parallel platform that is you know using ict platform for exchange of information and evidence between countries then when the accused is remanded so usually he'll have to be produced before magistrate but uh suppose he is in the judicial custody that is he is in prison current law allows for his production through video conference so now this has helped a lot in terms of saving the time in terms of saving the human resource the finance which was earlier involved in bringing the accused from prison to the you know, to the court and all so that way it has been helpful especially from the state perspective but many times since it's again using a platform where there is no direct interaction between the court and the you know accused so you know many times when you see it from the human rights perspective of the accused so maybe that's where we are compromising with the needs but then anyway at least it has fastened the process so probably you know something like that can also happen when it comes to say you know collection of evidence so basically extending the usage of video conference when i was mentioning about examination of witnesses under 160 161 so do uh, do i said the video conference is at not utilized there but in the course of trial 
we've already started using video conference as a mode through which witnesses are examined through which vic victims have been examined especially for cases and the pokso and also in other criminal matters witnesses from abroad and all have been examined by using video conference as a platform for example in praful uh, desai case uh, the supreme court had long back itself said that video conference can be a mode through which you can you know examine witnesses from another country so something like that can get integrated with the investigation process at the end once the investigation is over the ivo files a charge sheet under section 173 especially when you depend on uh, ict technology to this extent so what you are next with charge sheet you know that decision needs to be taken on you know, what you need to provide as evidence before the court so that's where you will have to ensure that you only produce those evidences which are reliable authentic because when you use ict technology there is more scope for raising questions on uh, the grounds of reliability authenticity etc so ke keeping in mind the io will have to segregate the information between that which is essential for the case and that which you know not helpful for the case and accordingly file a charge sheet why is this a concern i'll explain about that in a short while when we get into evidentiary aspect so it's time to say is like from 154 till 173 wherever possible if cyber technology can be used it can be helpful from the io's perspective further collection of evidence from cyber technology as i said is quite easier because this is that platform with huge data is available you can use it in different manner so one is you can collect it in form of evidence the other is you can even collect it to profile an accused for example the way he is been using technology the way he is been behaving on social media so all these can sometimes help the state in profiling the accused especially when you use it along with say artificial intelligence etc especially for the offenders who commit cyber crimes etc so they can be easily profiled so on those contexts more research is supposed to be done more you know law needs to be uh, reframed or reviewed from that perspective um, in the course of say prevention of crime or preventing disturbance to law and order as as well as in the course of investigating crime state has already started using technologies like face recognition tools etc so even during the um, um, uh, anti ca protests so state had used face recognition tools and even similarly you know in the context of farmers re recent protests in delhi so the intelligence uh, the uh, investigating agencies have been using extensively the ict technology including face recognition tools as well as cctv footage etc lot of information might be available on social media about the victim about the suspects about the accused and this is something that the io you know can always use for again not in every case it's helpful but in some cases through social media crucial evidences can be available so and that is where you know social media related forensic you know discipline is also emerging as an extremely important domain today and of course in every conventional crime today we see that police you know uh, see for cctv footages including farmers protests or any other conventional crime so many times cctv footages can have lot of links uh, you know uh, uh, for further collection of evidence or can itself become an evidence for example few years back when in bangalore there was an unfortunate incident of murder of a journalist which took place so the police had gathered more than 500 cctv footages from that you know nearest vicinity and all you know where the offense had taken place so that's the extent of information that you can get at the same time it is so huge that it can even miss you know uh, lead the investigation so it's for the io to you know segregate all these contents and see what's necessary what's crucial what's you know relevant for his case again recording facilities and io can use uh, so over here i'm referring to audio and video recording when you do interrogations when you do identification parade when you do say um, uh, search and seizure so if at all it can be supplemented with recording facilities it would be helpful for the io uh, so this is how at every stage ict technology can be used but then what are the challenges since i started with constitutional principles you know which are nothing but in a way restrictions on the extent of power that the io has extent of utility that io can get through ict technology uh, so it is essential that he uses all these you know technology and the power that's conferred upon him by the law in a manner in which it doesn't you know amount to say a uh, breach of fundamental rights and it doesn't amount to say breach of statutory principles that are laid down under crpc as well so on one hand when you are using ict technology most of the cases i will get tempted to use this because this is so easily available every io will have a mobile phone that it can immediately take and start recording you know the seizure process 
but then think of the consequence of doing this during trial can you you know produce this as a form of evidence before the court so and then similarly sometimes you might just get you know similar location of victim and the accused being at one place so is that enough to crack the case so many times i use are tempted to you know conclude the case as soon as they get you know links like this to ict technology but often the case gets affected when it goes to the trial because this might not be enough to you know result in conviction because for conviction as i said earlier you need evidence of such quality and such quantity that it can prove the guilt of the accused not just you know by raising doubt but then beyond reasonable doubt because even if a small doubt an iota of doubt that comes up in the mind of the judge such doubts benefit should go to the accused so keeping in mind this the i o shouldn't hesitate shouldn't like you know hurry up in closing up the case as soon as it gets hints through this technology because this technology can easily give you hints but those hints can't be used as evidence so i o should be able to you know understand the difference between the information the data that he gets uh, be, uh, and then what data and information he can use as evidence before the court because when you take these as evidence before the court questions of reliability will be asked integrity will be asked authenticity will be asked as well as questions you know in relation to privacy right you know and uh, freedom of speech expression all those can also get affected and on those grounds also questions can be raised so therefore it is essential that he keeps in mind evidentiary issues when it comes to evidentiary issue it is essential that he also complies with cyber forensic procedure in cases where it is essential so if you're just getting hint is okay but if you want to use the contents from the digital devices or from that cyber you know or technology uh, as a tool through which you've got information as evidence ensure that you also parallelly comply with forensic procedure along with compliance to legal procedure uh, so both needs to be uh, shown compliance otherwise evidences will not get admissibility uh so as i was mentioning earlier there's a mismatch between what law expects you to do law expects you to prove the guilt you know by yourself against the accused beyond reasonable doubt etc um and for this you'll have to show compliance to standard operating procedures sops in relation to cyber forensic tools show compliance to privacy requirements certain seizure related restrictions so a lot of restrictions even within crpc are there so show compliance to that at the same time in reality many times showing compliance to these requirements may not be you know actually possible so that is where there is again a you know a need to relook at the existing law and reframe at least some parts of provisions so that there is better integration of ict technology and again privacy has always been a concern and in fact like many cases the investigating agencies have failed to get information on time evidence on time from the internet service providers and in fact that's where we look for evidence these days in most of the cyber crime cases as well as conventional crime cases which are under investigation you want evidence from servers located abroad you are, or you want information from internet service providers on the name of privacy you know we've been refused to get that on time that's the reason as to why as if now the state is thinking of having data localization you know uh, 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 law so in fact the pdp bill uh, which can probably come up you know any time soon uh, the personal data protection bill is insisting for data localization because many times you don't get this data on time and the reason why we don't get data are many and most importantly it is on the name of privacy so that's where even if we get data localization provision which you know uh, compels the industries to have a local copy of data you need to still show compliance to data protection privacy protection etc again when it comes to collection of evidence from another police station from another state from another country questions of jurisdiction will come and when there is a mismatch between their procedural law our procedural law their substantive law our substantive law so we see that you know there is more a hindrance to collect evidence so that's when probably technology helps in collecting evidence but since it's not in compliance with law so there might be questions raised on the grounds of admissibility so as i've already mentioned many times internet intermediaries also do not you know cooperate in this particular uh, aspect so therefore what is essential is that you are supposed to take care of the concerns of individuals especially the concerns of privacy freedom of speech and expression and today if you see it in the context of twitter so twitter is stuck between so many conflicting issues on one hand there been um, uh, uh, a question for blocking few accounts on the other hand there been question for not blocking few accounts 
you know blocking raises questions of freedom of speech and expression not blocking raises question of sovereignty of the state so that's why you know we see it, uh, we should wait and see how supreme court will address this concern yesterday in fact um, the central government has uh, 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 even gone to the extent of saying that you know the officers of twitter can also be subjected to legal actions if they don't show compliance to our law so that's why the business entities like industries are supposed to take a call on how they show their compliance to the uh, law of the country where they run their business so that's where again you have this technology which raises this complicated questions as to how do you take care of your users you know rights as well as the state's expectations so cyber technology therefore can be an extremely important tool in the hands of investigating agencies but then raises a lot of other questions when it comes to say converting this case from investigation into trial you know it's a very long process so once the matter is investigated and it goes before the court you need to show that you know all the evidence you've collected are good enough to be you know uh, appreciated as evidence so that's when there are many other legal requirements that needs to be complied with it's not just forensic procedure but it's also sometimes as simple as just producing a certificate for example when i produce my mobile phone as an evidence before the court so it's okay you just get it forensically examined use it straightly as a piece of evidence but when i do not produce my mobile phone as an evidence and instead of that i give output from the mobile phone in form of a soft copy or a hard copy sections like 65b of uh, uh, indian evidence act requires me to produce a certificate in large number of cases we've seen that because of absence of this certificate the evidence is not uh, you know uh, 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 received as uh, admitted piece of evidence the prosecution case you know uh, suffers because of this and we've seen lot of serious offenses including murder terrorism cases getting affected because yes you used technology to collect evidence but you not produced it in a manner in which it could have been you know uh, received as an evidence for example there is one case of karnataka high court that is uh, manohar was a state uh, where the karnataka high court says that cctv footage could not be used and this was a case of murder and court says cctv footage could not be used though it was very clear about the circumstantial evidence but because of absence of 65b certificate court says you know with this quality of evidence we cannot convict and they you know acquitted the accused so similarly large number of cases are getting affected because you're not showing compliance to law so using this you know technology is fine because as i said it's so easier that you know you can crack the case but then it's only like cracking the case but not legally resolving the case because to legally resolve you'll have to collect those evidences of such quality that it receives admissibility in the court that's why probably i was need more training more exposure to the legal requirements etc at the same time there is integration there is a need to integrate technical as well as legal procedure so this is in short as to what i wanted to say about how technology can be used in the course of investigation if there are any questions i can take up thank you then my then my Um, uh, we have uh, we do have a couple of questions actually. There was uh, uh, one of the participants who actually asked to throw some light on uh, zero FIR. Right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anmay. Uh, so um, preferably, uh, the police station which has jurisdiction is supposed to register the FIR. But as I said, these are general rules. There can be exceptions. So preferably, one which has jurisdiction should register FIR. but then if you see it from the informer's perspective victim's perspective so for me it's important that i register the fir you know as early as possible and all so when i go to the police you know many times i you know will be refused you know they they might refuse to register fir on the ground of lack of jurisdiction though there are a lot of cases including say bhajan lal case most importantly lalita kumari case where supreme court has said that you know you can't refuse to register fir and even lack of jurisdiction can't be a ground to refuse to register fir so these are the directions issued mandating registration of fir even if you look at the word used in section 154 it says the police officer who receives information in relation to a cognizable offense shall register fir so it uses shall which means it's mandatory to register fir but otherwise the general understanding is crime is territorial in nature so therefore 
that territories police are you know better you know uh, uh, equipped and empowered to register fir so why do we insist for territorial jurisdictional police to investigate see it's a matter of convenience it's because of principle of convenience now suppose i am a police officer say uh, from a police station so let's assume in vijayanagar in bangalore so it's more convenient for me to go collect the evidence from my area so and then i might know people or, or i might know the area where i can go and collect you know do search and seizure get people from that area for witnessing search and seizure so it's a matter of convenience but it can't be the ground to refuse to register a fir so therefore this concept of zero fir has emerged where you know court started saying that okay when you can't like you know register a fir because you don't have jurisdiction it's still okay to register a fir but don't assign the number so every time when an fir is registered they assign a number so in case of zero fir they just say don't assign the number register a fir because registering a fir on time you know is very very crucial especially for certain offenses the sooner you register which means the sooner investigation begins the sooner the information is shared so many times it's helpful for the victim for the investigating agencies etc so at least register a fir on time then transfer it to the appropriate police station which has jurisdiction for example like you know how it happens in another country so they there were two colleagues of mine senior professors who had been to uh, china on some you know official work but one of the senior professor lost uh, his mobile phone but immediately he could register the uh, case uh, you know uh, uh, through his uh, my another colleague's phone and by the time they could get down in the next railway station they got back their phone so which means so quick can be the process i know in india expecting this is difficult but at least registering fir on time is very very crucial especially when it comes to say offenses where immediate medical examination is required you no know, uh, of the victim or the accused etc so things shouldn't halt so that's the reason why they say like at least register the case without giving the number later you can you know transfer it to appropriate court so this is the concept of zero fir and thank you and uh, we have next question Uh, how do we protect sensitive information handled and uh, stored by third party vendors right so uh, uh, today again data data protection is something that's in a lot of debate across the world including in india so we classify data into personal data and non personal data personal data is that with which you are able to identify a natural person for example the name may not be enough but in combination with some other you know data if you are able to identify a person name of a person designation place of his work email id say pan number or aadhar number so that's personal data now within personal data we classify data into sensitive and non sensitive so sensitive personal data are you know they don't define but they mean that they so sensitive that if you do not like protect it it can be misused for fraudulent activities etc for example bank you uh, know uh, account details or medical details etc now coming to sensitive personal data when it comes to an io as of now there is no restriction on like you know what he can access and all but the whole restriction is on when he you uh, know breaches its confidentiality without the permission of law so as an io when i confiscate a mobile phone in the mobile phone i can come across data personal data sensitive personal data now the pdp bill is going to use another term called critical personal data so which means they're going to notify some data as critical personal data so irrespective of how you call what you call you can access it but the whole problem lies in when you leak it without you know sanction of law i leak it along with charge sheet to the court is okay but i leak it to the media so then i'm committing an offense under section 72 of the it act so that's about the investigating agency when it comes to industries including isps so they are also supposed to take care of this personal data including sensitive personal data though they are different but the current law information technology act under section 43a treats both similarly it says when an industry that is a corporate entity is handling personal data or sensitive personal information so they almost use both as one and the same so in any any industry handling this data is supposed to take care of such data how do they take care they have to show compliance to due care and caution etc so what is the due care and caution so they have their set of do's and don'ts prescribed under 43a in form of 43a rules when i comply with all those rules i am taking care of your data despite that if there is a breach i am not responsible so as an industry if i show that i have complied with 43a regulations you know then i am not liable you know especially when civil liability question is raised so that is about 43 a civil liability industry is not liable if they show compliance to due diligence when it comes to an industry breaching confidentiality and privacy 
uh, then they can be subjected to criminal liability under section 72A of the IT Act. So it says any individual, including an industry like an ISP, uh, while you know, discharging their duty under any contract, etc., come across any information, the confidentiality of which is breached by them, they can be subjected to criminal liability. So, so this is 72A. So both 43A, 72A, wide enough to impose civil and criminal liability upon the industries which are handling any kind of data, including sensitive person information. So that's in theory, that's in the law, but I haven't seen any case coming under 72A. At least 43A, there are a couple of cases where banks have been held liable, offices of banks have been held liable, uh, but when it comes to 72A, it's hardly invoked provision. Uh, similar is also 72, where IVO could be held liable, but we haven't seen any cases filed under that. Uh, yeah. Next question, uh, are our judges trained enough in cyber laws to understand and appreciate evidences collected in the virtual world? Yeah, uh, so in fact, we have a judge who's attending the webinar, Ms. Nalini Kumari, and uh, she's also doing a PhD on a similar area. So usage of ICT technology, in administration of justice system. A lot has been done, not just to train judiciary, but also all you know, uh, law enforcement agency members, all the machineries through which justice is administered in our country. But then this is a never ending process because the technology is such that it is so fastly advancing. And uh, forget about training, but then even like, you know, handling the device. Suppose I have a forensic tool with which I can say, let's assume user, uh, with which I can collect evidence, you know, from a mobile phone, which was manufactured, uh, say in 2020. The same tool, I can't use it on a mobile phone, which is manufactured in 2021. The simplest example I can give is this. When tools itself aren't you know, equipped to handle advanced versions of technology, training, of course, you know, can become outdated you know, very fastly. So this is one law where training has commenced in 2000, should continue because 2000 was when the IT Act came. We also received our training in Cayley College itself. That's where our learning began. But it's a continuous learning process, be it for the judges, or for the investigating authorities, or even for teachers who would want to teach you know, this particular subject. So it should be a continuous process. And I think that individuals' passion to learn is more important because every time expecting state to train is also not possible. State has been doing a lot, but yeah, I think it also depends on how the IO and the concerned judge also you know, uh, himself learns. And that's the approach adopted in US and other country where you know, when a case comes, the uh, judges don't wait for you know, state help. They themselves get into R&D, try to learn, and you know, uh, try to you know, uh, resolve the issue you know, pending before them. And, uh, next is not actually a question, but he's actually asking uh, your opinion on uh, one of the recent initiatives taken by the union ministry, uh, where Uh, Tanmay, I think I lost. Uh, uh, which has started a project. Yeah. Ma'am, can you hear me? Yeah, can you repeat the last few words? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, one of the participants is actually asking your opinion on the Union Ministry's very uh, recently started project known as Indian Cybercrime Coordination Center, which was started in Jammu and Kashmir last week, where the police issued a circular asking citizens to register themselves as cyber volunteers under uh, certain categories called a cyber volunteer or uh, unlawful content flagger, cyber awareness promoter and so on. That's a very good question because it helps a lot of people who are attending this webinar to be a part of this, you know, regulatory mechanism. The uh, the whole project has been like, you know, few uh, since few years it's getting implemented. It started with a project called ICJS, Integrated Criminal Justice System. So under that you have this IC3 that is in... Uh, cybercrime coordination teams that are set up. So basically using technology to uh, say crack the cases and all, and also to collect the evidence, to store the evidence and all. So it's a very, very huge project. So as a part of it, a lot of states have initiated this, you know, online registration of FAR or say, or even like you know, collecting evidence or sharing evidence through ICT platform and all. Uh, so that's different from, um, and you know, volunteering yourself to help the state in regulating crime. So the Minister of Home Affairs has come up with this portal where volunteers can register themselves 
um, especially uh, to regulate offenses such as uh, uh, sexually abusive contents available online and to also regulate cyber pornography kind of an offense so anyone who comes across you know these kind of contents can flag these contents bring it to the notice of mha and all so that's why they are you know expecting volunteers to do this so um, and the portal is open for everyone anyone can register yourself as a volunteer to you know uh, just share this information that you come across on social media or other internet platform share it with the concerned you know uh, uh, agency through that portal and that leads to investigation so anyone can do this uh, one last question uh, can whatsapp chats be considered as uh, crucial evidence in case in a case see anything be it uh, contained from the cctv footage or whatsapp you know communication or mobile phone you know uh, uh, recordings anything can be evidence provided you are able to fulfill that requirement of authenticity integrity etc that itself is a different topic so maybe some other time we should be discussing about it but very briefly so it all depends on how you have you know got this content so as of now breach of privacy you know will might not affect the evidential value because as i said some high courts have said it's mandatory that you know you get a, a, a warrant from the court and all to confiscate mobile phone otherwise it is because it's breach of privacy you know will not provide evidential value but it is still not been a you know state decisis across the country in the sense you don't have a supreme court judgment in this regard so which means breach of privacy while collecting evidence is a parallel issue evidentiary uh, aspects cannot be questioned but the way you collect it is what matters so if you have used you know scientific process if you have extracted it by using forensic process etc if you are able to show reliability authenticity etc then you can certainly get admissibility but however there is one section i think it's 88e of the evidence law which says that you know if suppose the content has gone from mobile phone the law allows you to presume that it is been sent from my mobile phone but you cannot presume that i have sent it so sent from my mobile phone you prove it with forensic you know tools and all sent by me or to additionally prove but at least like half of your job is done if you have used technical process of extracting that evidence be it from whatsapp or cctv whatever but the rest again you need other circumstantial evidence other you know uh, you know co uh, corroborating evidences so for the fact that it's just on mobile phone you know doesn't affect its evidential value that's the object of unsettled model law which was the basis for it act the it act whole object was to give equal you know uh, legal recognition to paper based document to electronic documents which you would give for paper based document similarly the evidence law provisions which underwent change is also because of this they say like you know just because it's available on an online platform doesn't mean that you can you know uh, refuse to admit this as a piece of evidence as long as it is authentic and all so nothing stops you from accepting this as a piece of evidence but yes the factual difficulty lies in as to how you get this you know content unless one of the person involved in whatsapp conversation has helped you in collecting evidence or you have decryption key and all it's difficult to collect because this is all end to end encrypted content so how you get the content factually is difficult but beyond this if you've got uh, i think admissibility should be just uh, you know decided based on how you you know decide other digital evidences or evidences you get through digital devices um uh, thank you very much for uh, addressing all those uh, questions uh, posed by our participants and uh, now i take this opportunity to invite our uh, principal sir dr uh, j malika junaya sir to uh, make his presidential remarks sir please thank you tanmay thank you Tanmay, you need to unmute. Thank you, thank you, Tanmay, for unmuting me. Uh, good morning, Madam Nagratna. Morning, sir. And uh, Madam Narini Kumari. I'm sorry, Nagratna, I could not wish you in the beginning because okay. I was navigating between two devices, <laughs> and uh, I did cause some disturbance. Tanmay immediately uh, muted me. <laughs> no problem sir yeah. uh anyway uh, thank you so much for such uh, authoritative presentation in a very lucid form as you know actually i do not claim expertise in criminal law leave alone cyber law though we began the journey to understand information technology law way back in 2008 i believe 
the kind of uh, journey that you traveled and uh, the depth that you have achieved in the subject is really appreciable and uh, we are really proud of you and congratulate you for this very you know authoritative presentation for such long time and also for taking the questions uh, with uh, uh, you know uh, perfect answer to meet the situation well uh, as we all know we have been in fact we were saying the information technology is all pervasive and it was all pervasive however during and after pandemic time the usage of uh, information technology and the related issues in the form of cyber crimes etc have grown in multifolded uh, ways in fact we have witnessed the situation of metamorphosis so under these circumstances having an inclination into cyber law information technology law especially investigation criminal investigation has been need of the hour for the stakeholders be they the students be they the lawyers thank you so much for that uh, authoritative presentation indeed and i must appreciate the acknowledge and appreciate the presence of madam nelly kumari i'm really happy that a judge coming on our uh, uh, platform and uh, participating this only testifies the importance of interaction between judiciary and the legal academia this gesture indeed is uh, inspiring and very satisfying ma'am madam nayini kumari thank you so much for being with us on this occasion i think uh, i must congratulate and thank dr anita and our team for organizing this uh, meaningful seminar on this day on a very interesting and contemporary topic thank you thank you one and all uh, for the opportunity to pitch in at this hour thank you thank you very much sir now we uh, formally come to the end of the session and uh, i take this opportunity to uh, thank everyone uh, who has made this uh, program a grand success first i would uh, thank our principal sir dr j mallikarjuna sir to uh, in uh, supporting all of us in organizing uh, uh, such webinars all throughout the time uh, of this pandemic where uh, students and you know the people across the globe are not able to have the normal life so with principal sir's uh, support we are able to arrange such uh, you know knowledgeful uh, program sir thank you very much uh, secondly i would uh, uh, extend thanks to our academic coordinator dr anita mj ma'am uh, for uh, taking up uh, this opportunity given by our principal sir and uh, meticulously you know arranging all the things right from our uh, guest and uh, you know persuading me in uh, putting the technology both uh, the program is being live streamed also and uh, it's also on the zoom platform where all the students are directly being part of this across uh, india thank you very much ma'am for uh, you know putting all the people together and making this uh, program a grand success and next i would thank all the faculty members who have uh, supported in organizing this program and also the students from kelly law college and the students from across all the colleges of india and also academicians judges and professionals across india joining and participating in this program thank you very much thank you anand thank you sir thank, thank you anand thanks sir thank you nagratna thanks everyone yeah. thank you yeah my special thanks to tanmay so who has coordinated the technological aspect we are not aware much so it is tanmay who has taken the lead and done all these things thank you tanmay once thank again. you ma'am thank you very much thank you thank you sir Thank you. Mama, I'll end the program.